Hello, Year 6. I hope you've had a lovely weekend. Um, we are back for story time with Chapter 12 of Sky Circus. Um, so we will carry on. We have just found that Lily and Malkin are locked up with the other hybrids from the circus, uh, whilst Robert seems to be being made to work for the circus. Malkin growled and stood before her, but Lily couldn't tear her eyes from Luca's great claws. She recalled what the ringmaster had said about them. His gruesome app appendages can cut through steel like paper. Don't get too close or anger him, ladies and gents, for he can tear off your nose with a single snap. Yeah. Malkin bared his teeth at the boy, and Lily felt a sudden flash of panic. She grabbed the fox's scruff to stop him attacking. Why are you here? Luca demanded, stepping closer with a face like thunder. Lily shuffled back towards the door, the end of her scarf dragging in the dust. She felt lost for words. The sight of Luca, with his clattering claws and his deep blue angry eyes, didn't fill her with dread. It only made her confused. They were so alike, her and him, but she wasn't sure how to explain it. We're here because Madame took us, she said haltingly. Kidnapped us last night, after the show. Fox napped in my case, Malkin added through his teeth. Her and Slimwood's ruffians, I mean. The circus men, Lily continued, they trapped us in the hold and then spirited us away. I tried to warn you, Malkin groused. But you wouldn't listen. We couldn't understand you, Malkin. You, you had a muzzle on. This is your fox, Luca pointed a claw at Malkin. And assume you're an orphan, he jested at Lily. His face softening on that last word. I think you mean she's my human, Malkin said. Tell me, how do you live in a place like this? It stinks to high heaven. Shh! Lily grabbed him by the scruff of the neck. If she wanted to persuade what she guessed were the other two hybrids to come down, and convinced all three of them to help her escape, she'd need to stop Malkin causing any trouble. Yes, she said to Luca. He's my fox. Papa gave him to me as a present. He's a mechanimal. His name's Malkin, and mine's Lily. We're awfully pleased to meet you, she added, for she'd been taught to be polite, and though she wasn't always in, although she wasn't always, in this case, she felt like she should try to make friends. Malkin didn't seem to agree. I've yet to decide if I feel the same way, he said with a little growl, raising his hackles and pulling back his lips to reveal his yellow teeth. Luca laughed, very sensible. And what home are you from? Brackenbridge, uh, Brackenbridge Manor. It's in the town you visited yesterday. He looked confused. I've never heard of that one. Aren't you listening, Luca? Said the high-pitched voice from above. She said she had a papa. She's not from an orphanage. She's from a real home. The girl who spoke and peered over the side of her bunk. Her face was round and friendly, with doughy cheeks and a warm smile. She shifted awkwardly and began to climb down, and Lily saw her mechanical legs. It was Dee Dee, the wire-walking hybrid from the show. Well, surely that meant the third figure, up in the top corner bunk, had to be Angelique. Lily darted her glance, but she was still huddled beneath her blanket. Dee Dee jumped to the floor. Do you have a mother and father? she asked, hiding nervously behind Luca. Her mechanical legs whirred beneath her when she moved. They were a little too long in proportion to her body and made her look delicate and stork-like, as if she was perched on miniature stilts. Lily shook her head. Only a father. I never knew my mamma well, she added he hesitantly. She died when I was quite young, although lately you might say we've started talking again. She felt for the torn pages in her pocket. Luca looked at her as if she was mad, but Dee Dee didn't seem to have noticed her odd comment. We three are from different orphanages, she explained to Lily. We were taken years ago, not by the circus, although this is where we've ended up. She had a habit of holding her arms away from her body when she talked, as if she was thinking about balancing all the time. We weren't always hybrids, Luca added. We were human once too, like you. An evil, evil doctor called Droz plucked us from the our, our orphanages, changed us in a lab and sold us onto the circus. That's terrible. Lily felt sick. In her notebook, Mama had mentioned being taught by Dr. Dross. 
Billy hated to think that her mamma had had a connection to such an awful man. Then, for the first time, Angelique spoke. Droz only takes children no one will miss, she explained quietly. Children like us. She had shifted to the edge of her berth and was peering down at them. Her hair was pinned in two thick but dark bunches, and her brown eyes were set wide apart under wispy eyebrows, the left one marked by a cut. You were at the show last night, Angelique said, sitting next to a boy I recognised. Bartholomew, his name was. Tolly, you mean, Louis asked. Is that what he's called now? Angelique's eyes brightened. I remembered his face. There was something familiar about it. Lily recalled what Tolly had said last night at the show. He told me you were at an orphanage together in London, she said to Angelique. Yes, the Camden Workhouse, for the infirm and physically incurable. I was taken. He wasn't. Angelique jumped from her bunk, flapping her wings. Her feathers scraped the metal walls of the cell as she wafted down to float a few inches from the floor. Finally, she seized her stick from where it leaned against the edge and came to rest fully on the ground. She moved with concentration, like the slightest misstep or loss of control might bowl her over, as if gravity might well, sneak up on her from behind and tip her off her feet. Lily thought it a strange ballet, but rather beautiful. I never spoke back then, Angelique said. Fear made my words dry up inside me. Tolly changed that. He was the only one who ever showed me any kindness. She smiled at the thought of him. On the ground, she looked slighter than the other two, though her wings made her seem grander. And her demeanour towards the pair, like an older sister, made Lily sure she was the eldest of the three. Older than she'd looked on the ticket, perhaps 16 or 17. He would, spend up, he would send up my lunch in the basket every day, and when I returned my plate to him, I would send him little gifts and notes, and he would do the same. Is he with you? I would dearly love to see him again. I heard there was a new boy brought aboard too. Is that him? Lily shook her head. No, that's my friend Robert. Tolly managed to escape. He's back in Brecon Bridge. He'll tell Papa what's going on, and they'll come and rescue us. She didn't know if this was true or not, but it sounded reassuring. They'll have to find us first, Dee Dee said. We've tra travelled a long way since last night. Did you hear where we've landed? Luke asked. Madame told us Paris, Lily said. Only it didn't look much like it when we uh, took it, when she took us out of the cargo bay. More of a wood, really, with some buildings behind it on the horizon. Paris again, Dee Dee whispered, and the three of them shuddered. That's a long way from home, Luca said. Yes, it is, Lily replied, although she wasn't sure if they were talking about her home or theirs. But but Tolly will get a message to my father, she added again, more to reassure herself than them. Malkin nodded wisely. He's a good pup. If he's a friend of yours, Angelique said, then I think we can trust you. I have another question, Dee Dee interjected. If you weren't kidnapped from an orphanage or sent by Dr. Droz, then why has Madame put you in here with us? I can't answer that, Lily said. The secret of her cog heart had already led her into this danger, and the thought of more people knowing about it filled her with itching anxiety. Can't or won't, Luca said, peering at him. You're a strange one, Lily. Neither fish nor fowl. You look human, but Madame put you in the room 13 with us, so I'm guessing you might be a hybrid. She doesn't want to tell us she doesn't have to. Angelique admonished Lucas softly. <clears throat> That's right, Dee Dee agreed. She's scared, poor dear. She's no idea what's what. One moment she's in the audience enjoying the show and the next she's imprisoned here. She put out a hand and touched Lily's shoulder. Lily realised the hybrids had no inkling of Madame's plan for her, or who she really was. To stand any chance of breaking out of this place, she would have to gain their trust. Yet the thought of speaking to them about the cogheart sat heavy inside her, like a giant immovable boulder that was not ready to be rolled aside. She glanced at Malkin. He said nothing. Should she tell her secret? Was it safe? In the past, Papa had used silence to keep the truth hidden. Even from her, it hadn't worked. She'd found out about the cogheart. And so had others. Three evil hybrid men named Roach, Mold and Silverfish, who tried to kill her for it. Since then, it always took her a long time to trust people. 
But these hybrid children were different. More like her. Last night at the show, they looked sad and downtrodden, as frightened of the rest of the circus folk as everyone in the audience had been of them. But here in this room, they were friendly and attentive. Dee Dee's expression was placid and neutral, like, while Luca wore a concerned frown. Angelique's eyes were wide with anticipation and intrigue. There was something about her that made Louis believe she could be trusted. Perhaps she would understand. Perhaps they all would. If Lily opened up to them, told them the story of her heart, maybe they would open up to her in return. Because truth mattered, and so did what you really were. Mama had said so, hadn't she? Whereas Papa's lies had only caused her family trouble. No, to survive here, Lily realised she would have to be like Mama. Suddenly she remembered Mama's exact words written in the red notebook. What would you do if you weren't afraid? She looked around at the hybrids, all watching her expectantly. And just like that, she knew she would tell them the truth. Robert stood alone in the freezing clearing, waiting for the luck. He rubbed his hands together, feeling, well, feeling rather sorry for himself as he watched the progress of the circus. People who were busily attaching lengths of rope to two large tent poles the size of tree trunks. The clothes Thunwood had given him were threadbare and covered in big splatters of mud. If Mrs. Rust or Miss Top could see how scruffy he looked, they'd probably blow a gasket each. He did miss them. Brackenbridge Manor, too. He would so dearly love to be there now, with John and all the mechanicals jittering round the house. Even Rusty telling them off for, the, for sneaking out would be better than this. Anything would be better than this. He wished he still had the moon lockets. It reminded him of his ma and gave him hope. That is, before Slimwood took it. It seemed to Robert that Slimwood and Madame had similarly stolen everyone's hope in this place, and he'd need to keep a hold of his if he wanted to get his locket and the rest of his things back and find Lily and Malkin. Heads up, coming through, came a shout from behind. Robert turned to see two horses trot round the stern of the skyship. Dimitri was riding the black horse bareback and ducked under the engine prop. Silver followed, riding the white horse. Dimitri and Silver circled the horses about, and then Dimitri jumped down from his mount and handed its reins over to Silver. Someone threw him a length of rope that was attached to one of the poles, and he tied it to a harness hanging over his horse's back. Oi, you, Flatty! Silver called down at Robert from where she, where she sat. Don't just stand there goggling at everyone like an owl in an ivy bush. Lend a hand. Are you talking to me? Robert asked. Who else? Who else would I be talking to? Silver replied. Flatty means landlubber. Get over here, would you? I can't. He shook his head. I'm supposed to wait for the lunk to allocate my chores. That creaking calamity, Silver spat. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Come with us instead. We'll give you a job. Make sure you look busy. Thank you. Robert advanced anxiously towards them, unsure about the shifting horses. Have you seen my friends? They were taken to room 13. I need to get a message to them. Oh, and I need to get my clothes back from the laundry. Silver jumped down from the back of her horse and took its reins. No, I haven't seen your friend. As for your clothes, it's, well, it's wash day tomorrow. If you sign up for tub duty, you might be able to find them then. Otherwise, you'll discover they got absorbed into the outfits of the show. But they belong to me, Robert exclaimed. They have my things in. Valuable things, Silver asked. Robert nodded. Then the best you can hope for is that Slimwood doesn't find them, she gestured to Dimitri, who was busily harnessing a rope to the back of a horse now. I'm Silver, by the way, and this is Dimitri. My name's Robert. He nodded at Dimitri, who had the same coal black hair and brown eyes as Silver. Is he your brother? Silver laughed. No. I suppose we do look alike, but he's nobody's brother. He's got no folks. I may be nobody's brother, Dimitri replied with a, rush, with a soft Russian accent, but everyone's son. I belong to the whole Sky Circus. What's that mean? Robert asked, intrigued despite himself. Fourteen years ago, Dimitri explained, when old Slimwood Sr., Slimwood's father, was navigating the circus through the steppes of Russia, he found me, hidden behind a hay bale in the horse stall. I'd snuck aboard when they'd stopped at their last atchings. That's Polari, Silver interrupted, 
Traveller speak for. I know, Robert said. Place to land. Make camp. Very good, Flatty. Silver looked impressed. She led both horses forward until the ropes behind them stretched and grew taut. The tent poles gradually began to rise, pivoting from the base as the horses strained to pull them upright. Dimitri lent a hand, pulling on the rope along with the horses, trying to make it easier for them. One of the old Rousties, Ted, he explained, was a horseman in the show. Rousty means roused about, Silver said, interrupting Dimitri again, which is to say people who do the put-up and take down of the circus, but who aren't your actual acts. There are quite a few rousties on this crew. She nodded at the men who were pinning out guy ropes now to hold the poles in place. They work for Slumwood and Madame and Aunt, Madame and aren't to be trusted. Can I continue? Dimitri asked, amused. Ted took care of the horses and me, and the circus became my family. Then when I was big enough, I looked after the horses too. They were always my favourite. And when I was in the stables, everyone took turns to care for me. But that was before he paused. Before what? Robert asked. What happened? Old Mr. Slimwood died. Just eight months ago. Dimitri nodded at the juggling clubs that hung from the side of the skyship's gondola. Those are his clubs right there. And those are Ted's stirrups. Now Slimwood's son is in charge. Along with that awful madame. Circus doesn't mean family to them. Only money. More circus folk were laying out strips of canvas beneath the newly erected poles and lacing them together. Slimwood paraded along among them, wielding his whip on anyone who wasn't working fast enough. He was a horror show. Robert couldn't believe that this was his family circus, his father's, and he turned into such a miserable place. Grab hold of that horse, will you, Flatty? Dimitri called, bringing him back to the present. Silver can't manage them both on her own. Dimitri began untying the hauling ropes and the harnesses from the white stallion. Robert did as he was told. He stood behind Silver and took up the reins of the black horse, stroking its steaming flank to try to calm it down. He could feel the animal's ribs beneath its fur as it breathed in and out. Why is he so thin, he asked Silver. Slimwood doesn't feed them properly, she explained, and they're made to do all this heavy lifting, just like us. Did he really kill all those people, Robert? Did he really kill all those people? Robert stared at the line of trinkets hanging from the ship. He got rid of them somehow, Silver said, stroking the muzzle of the white horse. Him and Madame. Acts that had been here years. They said they were leaving. Promised to write. But we never heard from them again. So yeah, for all we know, could be dead. After Sunwood Senior was gone, Dimitri continued, Madame and Sunwood took over his quarters and the office and the comms room on the top floor. He nodded at the highest row of windows in the gondola. They stopped anyone going up there. Pretty soon, that part of the Sky Circus ship was totally out of bounds, private for their use only. Then they hired new roustabouts to guard everyone, put up fences and locked us all in our berths. Silver gestured at all the high wall around the site. Before we knew it, the place became a prison. The black horse whinnied and pulled away from Robert. Hush, Sampano, Dimitri said softly to it, as he finished unyoking the white horse and started in on the black. Don't let him go, Silver whispered. If you do, it'll be bad news for him and for us. Robert could feel his feet slipping. The rope chafed against his palms, coarse against his skin. He gritted his teeth, locked his fingers together and stood firm, until his shoulders ached from grasping the rope. Thanks for your help, Flatty. Dimitri took the reins of the black horse from Robert and tied him up to a ring on the gondola. Silver tied up the white horse herself next to him. It appeared to be called Mr. Kite. As Robert watched them talking to the animals, he realised things might not be quite as bad as they'd seemed. He'd made new friends. Purr, purr, purr. A short blast sounded on a whistle. Scrams up, Dimitri said. That's lunch, Flatty, Silver explained. Everyone abandoned the half-constructed tent, downing tools and heading for the main hatch door on the port side of the Sky Circus gondola. The lunk stood in the doorway, his metal jaw grinding up and down, silently counting them all in. As Robert, Dimitri, Silver joined the queue on the ramp, Robert spotted something at the o over the treetops. A gigantic spiked tower of iron. Zeps bopped around, like bees on a flower. A few were even moored to it by anchor ropes. What's that? He asked the other two, pointing to the tower 
pointing the tower out to them. The Eiffel Tower Air Station, Silver whispered. Flights arriving into Paris take off and land there. How far away is it? Robert said quietly. Miles, Silver replied under her breath. This is the Bois de Boulogne, which is a wood on the outskirts of the city. We're prisoners anyway, Dimitri muttered. We're not allowed near places like that, so you won't get to see it. Well, I will if I get out, said Robert softly to himself. As their part of the queue reached the gondola and they trooped inside, a thousand and one plans flitted through his mind. First, he had to save Lily and Malkin from room 13, then get a message to John in England, then get his locket back and finally get them away from here in one piece. And he would start as soon as he recovered the laundry bag. Well, we will have to see whether Robert is successful. We'll also have to see what happens to Lily when she tells the other hybrids about her heart. Thank you for joining me again. I'll see you again tomorrow.